The Guardian at the Threshold, an archetype that parapsychologists have obsessed over for centuries. A mythic entity who's appeared in the stories of innumerable cultures. No matter their description, his role is always the same. To confront anyone who dares cross into unseen worlds. In our last session, he spoke to her or through her. Even when I listen to the tape, I can't be certain what I'm hearing. Still, I repeated his words like a sickness ever since. It went like this. Cross the sill, sink in a twinkling, cast aside the old sleep, to sleep again anew. The Candleman, the Ferryman, indeed the Guardian at the Threshold, an Eidolon on the inside, determined to keep me out. You're listening to The Sounds of Nightmares, an audio fiction series from the world of Little Nightmares. Noon was right after all. I noticed something off while reviewing the EEG and reluctantly sent her up to radiology. At first I doubted the validity of the results, but the technician assured, curtly, that Noon's scan undeniably shows a pea-sized tumour on the right-sided amygdala. They maintain it's benign, despite the unusual ocular appearance. This calls everything into question. The mass's location could impact fear response, emotional salience, and damningly, dreams. And yet, I cannot deny all the evidence to the contrary. I've pondered the ethics of informing Noon. She's already so scared of her body that it would only send her spiraling can't risk anything jeopardizing a revelation that might lead to Cece. From here on, anyone listening will think me mad. But the proof is in the pudding. Noon's vanishings, her transpersonal states, they're undeniable evidence of a realm beyond our senses. It's always been on the periphery, but now I know. It's accessible. And she possesses the means to enter that domain. My professor's paper posits thus. There are two requisites for entering the quiddity of consciousness. First, a gateway, places hidden amid our world. Second, a means to open these doors. And I assert that keys are primarily cut out of fear. <sighs> Either I lack his erudition or his mania. My only hope lies in completing my labors. <sighs> I've not slept in weeks. <sighs> and if I cannot dream as she does, I'll never know how to enter. This nowhere. A 
An ugly autumn night, isn't it, Noon? Swirling mist, they called it on the broadcast. A weather phenomenon unique to the counties. The downpour is not far off. But a gift may brighten the mood. Here. Oh, it's nearly the same. Red too. A chrysanthemum, like your parents left you all those weeks ago. An apology, a reminder that I remain as committed to you as I did then. Pretty. It's a perennial, so it'll blossom year after year, just like you. I think I'm ready now to talk about my mum and dad. Oh, and why now? What's changed? Because I feel like I'm beginning to forget, and maybe talking will help me remember. Because you've been away so long, or you literally feel you're losing your memory? Um, more like I'm losing a part of me. I can't tell, am I the girl here or the one there? They're one and the same. Given all you've told me, they must be. It's not you that's different, but the physical space around that, that... I said I want to talk about my mum and dad. When most kids have nightmares or whatever these are, they go to their parents to feel better. Here, I relive them again and again. And it's all you want to talk about because you think you can find Cece through me. Noon. The only way to find answers is to discover where you go when you sleep. Talking about your parents would be wasting the hours. Aren't these sessions supposed to be about me? Always. But I've no say. No control. Over how I feel or what I do. I don't even belong to myself. I'll do as you ask, but promise me. No wires hooked into my head. No machines. Not tonight. No machines, promise. I think you'll enjoy what I've got planned. This bed was for shift work. Now I sleep here more days than not. Oh, pretty. I'd like to try a sort of role reversal. I'll lie here blindfolded, depriving my senses to enter a self-induced hypnagogia so I can focus on your words. You'll recount your latest visit and I want you to try as hard as you can to project your dream into my head. I don't think it can work, but I'll try. That girl in the photo there, that's her. Your daughter? My sister. Oh. You don't look much alike. I'm... I, I'm settled. Blindfold on. Carry me away with you, Noon. I couldn't see anything. S slow down. This is vital. Speak as if you're trying to pull me in. I floated through a darkness with nothing at my feet. Then it all faded and I was somewhere new. An underground brick tunnel with a stream of thick sludge passing through a canal at its center. I can still hear it. Jangling keys. Screaking metal. Do you hear, Otto? I... I can't. But keep trying. It came from a kid in the distance, struggling to shut a grand iron door. The last thing I heard before the slamming shut was laughter. Sludge poured in from the pipes that ran along the tunnel walls. I had no choice but to follow the stream, and so I did until I reached a section 
where I saw storm dreams above. Looking up through one, I saw a boy's dirty boots and orange light shining from a lantern on his waist. We locked eyes and he called out, Look! Look critters already! Lights then shone down from every drain above. Other boys and girls wanting to peek at me. Very suddenly, they went quiet. I didn't know why until I heard it, a rumbling through the tunnels. They whispered together, it's here, finally here. Do you feel what I felt, Otto? They'd been waiting for you. Not exactly. Their joy, their bratty excitement. They gathered for an event and it had finally come. Like a holiday that only arrives once per year. Running from their celebration, I turned down a tunnel, going until I came to a junction. Overwhelmed by how many options surrounded me, I closed my eyes, listening. The sound came from the path to my left. I waited, watching from a distance as someone crossed by the dark tunnel mouth. He carried a strange gadget and every now and again, its buzz turned to some beeping, detecting secrets in the waters. I hardly noticed the rest of him, but I got a look before he crossed out of view. He carried a heavy sack over his shoulder, and things squirmed inside. But he was gone as quick as he'd appeared. The sludge was rising quickly up to my ankles, and the stink became so awful, Otto. Imagine it, waste filling your nose. Then, across from me, a small pipe became blocked, stopping the sewage. A grey mass poked through, jammed in tight, wiggling to get loose. But not until it fell into the sludge did I realise this tiny thing was alive. It picked itself up and swayed about, curious of my company. The head was, was shaped like those cone mushrooms that grow out in Hatefield. I inched closer to the little mushroom fairy and it began mimicking me as if we'd been old friends. A friendly presence. The first non-hostile being you've met that wasn't another child. Yes, he belonged there in that world, part of it rather than a stranger like me. Is, is it working, Otto? Can you see its little mushroom head? I think so, maybe. Keep going. Yes, drift away, Otto, drift away. crooked net lowered down from a drain grate above. While I ducked to cover, the mushroom fairy didn't. I tried to point upward, but it simply copied my gesture. There was a girl giggling with ugly delight, sticking her whole arm through the grate, hoping to capture the poor thing. So I grabbed a loose brick and threw it at her. Help! Hitting her arm, she cried out while I picked up the mushroom fairy and ran off.
After we were well clear, I put the creature down. It immediately walked off, then looked back, suggesting I follow. That little body clicked, jittery and ungraceful. Somehow the thing seemed to know where it was taking me, stopping only once we came to a rusty door leading to a maintenance room. Entering, though, I discovered something else entirely. Endless piles spread about the room, some of pure junk, while others house gold jewellery. As long as it could be collected, there was a place for it here. Mesmerising. Only after examining a mound of keys did I understand where this stuff came from. Everything in this room had been dropped down from the world above over the years. The only thing out of place was a child's propeller cap on a chair, tucked away, forgotten. I think that's what the mushroom fairy wanted me to see. As if on cue, I heard the man approaching. The little creature hid in a pile of mismatched mittens, and I jammed my way in too. I peered out as he stepped through the door and began dumping out his pockets. Coins, rings, trinkets. Next, he took off his plastic suit, covered in gunk. Beneath was a bony body. His spine bent horribly. What I thought had been a sack carried over his shoulder was the back of his head, like a balloon full of water throbbing and swollen. But I could tell he was not always that way. He'd changed, somehow become one with the sewers. I don't understand. You believe this place transformed him? Are you meant to be drifting into hypergoglia or whatever? Seeing, smelling, hearing as I did? I can't seem to let go. I want to, more than anything. I... Try! That's what you always tell me. If I'm trying my hardest, you have to as well. From the corner of my eye, I noticed the little cone sneaking away. The balloon-headed man was inches away, and in that moment, I thought of Jester, of the child with gooey hair, of Rusty. I couldn't do nothing, not again. Thankfully, that rumbling from earlier returned in that moment, stronger than before. The shaking destroyed the man's piles, startling him into an odd anger. So I stumbled out from hiding and bolted for my mushroom fairy, then out the door. I ran and ran and, and though the man wasn't very fast, that didn't matter. He had his gadget and that buzz followed wherever I went. Any sense of direction washed away with the sludge that was now up to my knees. Turning down tunnel after tunnel, I stopped hoping I'd lost him. All at once, those lanterns shone from above. The naughty kids had spotted us. Wildly, they sang, snatch a gift, snatch a gift, before they're all sent adrift. Their cheers grew, and, and I saw why. A bag-headed shadow appeared at the tunnel's far end, cutting me off. The man and his machine knew the tunnels as if as if the sewers had leaked into his thoughts. I tried to backtrack, but must have taken a wrong turn and found myself at a dead end, a wall of bricks. The mushroom fairy squirmed hard, begging to be freed. So I let go, 
And the grey cone climbed up a pile of fallen rubble and slipped through a crack without hesitation to abandon me, despite saving its life. The crack the fairy squeezed through began spouting water from the other side. I pulled at the bricks as the man stepped closer. One brick loose, then another. His gadget buzzed and buzzed when I ripped the final brick loose, leaving a hole large enough to creep through. He baited at the wall, grabbing at me, but I was too far gone. His small, milky eye peeked through at me until the walls rumbled more fiercely than ever. The man backed away, overcome with horror. The rumbling didn't stop after that, and neither did the kids cheering from above. Whatever they waited for, was time. Otto, you're awake. Yes, Noon. I'm trying so hard to see, to feel, to sense what you did, but I can't. I don't have the gift you have, and your gifts are not as commanding as I'd hoped I'd they'd... trade places with you in a heartbeat. I wish I could give you everything in my head. Then I'd be rid of all of this. Shall I go on? Yes. It felt as if someone had picked up the sewer, shaking it with rage. Water crashed against the walls. I stumbled on and on, the tunnel growing wider and wider. A second smaller sound appeared. Clicks and murmurs. Then, out of the darkness ahead, they appeared scurrying so fast I couldn't react. A hundred little mushroom fairies rushing past me in a panic, escaping something close behind. It wasn't long before that something came. Speeding like a pack of horses tangled together, a tidal wave pounded through the sewer. The wave was feet away when... I finally understood. For the kids above, this was a blast. They waited and waited, unable to experience the wave's power themselves. And that made them love it all the more. Snatching things that ran from its path was part of their awful celebration. The violent wave hit, sweeping me away, carrying me back through the maze of tunnels. I swam up and up, doing my best to surface, and just as I did, The waves paused. My body no longer needed to swim. And the candlemen appeared, floating on some kind of broken door. Go through your encounter diligently. He holds the answers I, we need. Make no mistake, he is your tormentor. I'm not sure that's true. This time, I was able to speak in his presence. Why do you bring me here? What do you want? He replied, Cross the sill. Sink in a twinkling. Cast aside the old sleep. To sleep again anew. I yelled back, Why? Why should I? Before I finished, he said, Light, not within, but without. Here, all banes be set free. More riddles. He doesn't think I can solve them, but I will. I already did. I think he means by giving myself to his world. I won't be ill any longer. That's why... When I'm there, no more headaches, no more parasites, no more tests. That's not true. It's not. I would almost prefer him to take me. Don't say that. Away from here, from you. It's what he wants. Maybe. He wants you. Maybe your Cece felt that way too. Relieved.
We're done tonight. Get out. To your room. Go. What's this? Nosing through my desk, were you? My name's on it. It's my scan, yes. Smart girl. What? What does it tell? That you've got a mass growing on your brain. A tumour. I knew it. The cure. How bad is... A mass in your brain is never good. You should have told me. Why? Why didn't you tell me? It's not my practice to tell before necessary. Now, get to bed. Fine. But after the candleman spoke, the wave carried me by the maintenance room again. The bag-headed man looked through a window, terrified. He was opposite to those kids above. Living down there, he, he'd no reason to celebrate the wave. Instead, he cherished what they dropped down by accident. You see, each wanted what the other had, but could never have themselves. I'm taking two sweets tonight. Take as many as you want and leave. <sighs> Perhaps I was cruel to tell her. But as she sleeps, I've been pondering the entry requisites specified by my professor. I believe he was only partly right. One need only look at the theatre of agony that the ferryman's created to understand fear is an essential requirement. And I know better than anyone, a little fear can compel us towards discovery. As for the gateway's location, perhaps it's not a place hidden in our world, but in our minds. Is it not possible that her tumour is somehow this unknown gateway? An organ of transcendence. The apparatus may be unfinished, but its own iography monitor is functional. If she's to cross over in a twinkling, what choice do I have? In her words, you must try. She hardly stirred at all while I pathed the BCI. All seems stable. As soon as her dreaming begins, the monitor should translate neural signals into visualizations. Otto. Shh. fought as long as she could, but finally succumbed. This is it. Show me, Noon. Show me the other side. Here we are. The image. A kaleidoscope of black. An unnatural abyss. Wait. A shape. It's difficult to see like looking through a negative mist. There, a silhouette. Ovula, splitting across the center. Ah, it, it, it glares like the sun. Oh no, a pupil made of light. Oh God, it's, it's watching me.
You've just listened to the fifth episode of The Sounds of Nightmares. This episode was written by It's Just Jord and Lonnie Nadler. Our showrunner is Lonnie Nadler, and the series is directed by Thomas Hoses. Noon is played by Amy Pursehouse and Otto by Kester Lovelace. Music created by Tobias, Livia, and Thomas Roses. Production supervised by Alizé Debar and Lucille Rousseau-Garcia. This series is based on Little Nightmares from Bandai Namco Europe.